So this is the Hera Proctor Community Forest, uh, which operates under a, an ecosystem-based conservation plan. But remember, less than one job per 1,000 cubic meters or logging truck. These guys make five to seven jobs for every uh, logging truck or tree cut, however you want to look at the, the, the denominations there. And they have a re produce really nice, high quality forest products. Uh, the best you can buy around here. Their prices are very competitive. Uh, and if you have to pay 5% or 10% more, well, think about it as uh, some money for earth, some money for forests. So that's, and if, if you make five to seven um, jobs compared to less than one, you could reduce the number of trees you cut by something in the order of 70 to 80% and still have the same number of jobs. Well, if we need a transition, a way to get from overcutting and climate disaster to climate mitigation and water protection, there's the economic side of it. It's not a hard thing to figure out. <clears throat> so uh, this is just another take on that hierarchy that I talked about. The ecosystem-based plan with lots of protected area, lots of green. So, as I said, we can, we can make this, this, this transition from less than one job to five plus uh, and reduce the cut. It provides a forest for ecological services, which is about survival, as well as diverse employment. We increasingly, and we're going to look at, uh, focusing on ecological restoration. We've got lots to clean up, and that's where a lot of the jobs can come from. Well, the first priority there is to stop doing it. So if we know that every clear cut requires restoration, let's stop clear cutting. Because every time we continue to clear cut, all we're doing is building the restoration debt for future generations. Uh, and along with that, we're going to assist natural processes to try to reestablish that natural composition structure and function. Here's a couple of examples. Uh, Daphne mentioned that I've been working on a book uh, with about the work uh, we've done with the Galliano Conservancy for the past 20 years to try to do something we don't know how to do, and that's to restore an old growth forest. Uh, I told you we don't know how they work, and I still don't think we know how they work but we're trying to reestablish natural composition and structure. So we've been killing plantation trees, making some, some snags, uh, moving big fallen trees around uh, to, that were piled up in what were called windrows so that we can get them back out to enrich the soil. Uh, and you know, it's amazing how, how well it's come back in many respects. I, Ken Millard, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago, and uh, who was one of the founders of the Galliano Conservancy, and I both uh, used to say to each other when we started this project that we're never gonna, we, we'd never live long enough to see it really look different and feel different. We were wrong. You know, it's pretty amazing how resilient these systems are. Uh, it's not just science, uh, and it's not just knowledge, but it's the love that you put back into that system that, that shines back towards you in big ways. Uh, this is ecocultural restoration that we do with the Hucklip First Nation, which is across uh, the Fraser River in the Fraser Canyon uh, from Lillooet. Uh, I've worked with Hucklip for more than 30 years, and they have been very firm people in in keeping their values alive on the land. And we, we build uh, what trees we might remove or cut there around not only reestablishing water and water, improving water in their territory, but in making sure the food and medicine plants that are important to their culture have the right habitats to grow in. So I'm gonna conclude by, with a, 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 some of the challenges that we have. You know, I've been talking a lot about intact forests. And I, I, the, the fact that 
things are steadily drying out, climates are heating up, all those problems we talked about, means we've got to think about are there places that we need to intervene as human beings to help forests survive. That's a, that's a thin, uh, that, that's a, a delicate thing because there can be a lot of hubris involved in that and a lot of, uh, of you know, kind of human arrogance. But if it's done in a precautionary way, uh, I think we need to do it. Because quite frankly, uh, we've got lots of forests right now due to fire suppression, uh, due to past history that have way more trees than climate change moisture uh, is going to allow to be there. And so we either have to come to grips with that and change some of that composition and structure in a precautionary way, or natural th th causes will, will change that. And those natural causes may be in the form of some pretty bad fire in places that we really don't want it, or we don't want it anywhere. But where do we do it? Well, dry, moisture-stressed areas uh, where, where that's increasing. We have lots of them. High fire risk areas. That means designing plans that estimate how fire could move in a landscape uh, and, and being able to pick those out. Uh, overstocked forests, which I just talked about. And fire behavior. Uh, we need to think about the patterns. Again, uh, we need to think about that <laughs> from an ecological standpoint, not a timber standpoint. That's the danger in these interventions, is that they can get twisted around, if we're not careful, uh, by strong special interests into being just another way to get access to the remaining forests. So uh, an important thing. Uh, we move the understory, thin the overstory, keep fire. I mean, one of the things that is a, a climate change corundrum is that we didn't used to think about fire here much in a lot of these stands. So multi-layered stands are very common here due to different degrees of requirement for light by tree species. And as a result of that, if you have uh, you can have cedar and hemlock in a kind of shaded position and then halfway up the crowns and the big trees. Now, uh, we've got to think about the fact that those become fire ladders. What's really flammable in a forest are those green crowns that are, can be thought of as kind of stored gasoline, terpenes, resins that are very flammable when they get to the right temperature. So if you have a ground fire, uh, and you don't have a way of lifting that into the crown, you have a lot better chance of dealing with uh, keeping fire from being a confla conflagration uh, as opposed to something that we could deal with. So we also want to think about drought resistance. Um, there, Western uh, Ponderosa pine, western larch, Douglas fir, uh, and western white pine have better drought resistance here than cedar and hemlock. Does that mean I think we should get rid of the cedar and hemlock? No. I'm not talking about something homogeneous here. I'm talking about something that you, you, we adapt and we apply some common sense. Like I still like the fact that if I wonder whether that tree should stay or go, I leave it. Because I get to decide as many times as I want to not to cut it. Uh, but I only get to cut it once. So, so I want to I, I make sure I'm comfortable with that. Burn accumulated fuels. Well, that's, you know, that's done in this valley. Uh, it's done in good conscience, I think, most of the time. Um, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle on that one. I, I, I would like to see some of it chipped. I'd like to see some of it lopped and scattered, means, so, a, a, and I'd like to see, a, especially where the fire ladders are gone, and, and, and you can leave that, that's short-term nutrients, that holds moisture in the ground, that keeps it from getting crunchier as, as, as soon as possible. So I think we've got to do a diverse, uh, look at that in diverse ways. So a few more th considerations here. Uh, 
we, it is our job to help systems that we've influenced adapt to climate change. Diverse activities, I mentioned that. And those activities should err on the side of protecting water. Go back to the drop where we started this evening. We want to think about doing things that protect that. Um, but I also know that intervention in some of these places feels uh, a lot like tension to me and what I'd like to do. Uh, I, I, I find this some of the most difficult time in my time of planning what to do in forests. It's just, it's, climate change has really complicated it. The other thing is minimize tramping around on the soil. Uh, we still, we, we need to think that one through carefully. Uh, don't, uh, because compacting soil, I can tell you from doing lots of soil degradation research, uh, ends up with being a big problem for water. And in the, in the absence of water, climate change has an even bigger hold on us. So what we're talking about really is balancing water conservation of intact forests with forest survival err on the side of protecting that ecological integrity. Uh, there's uh, a block in this valley on the Ponderosa main road uh, done by the, by CIFCO, the Sulcan Integral Forest uh, Co-op, uh, community forest. Lots of good things there. I'd like to see a little bit of that stuff that's gonna be piled and burned back spread around there. Uh, do I think what happened there is bad? No, I think it's good by and large. You know, I think it's one of the, I think it's definitely in the realm of things that we need to do in a lot of places. Uh, but I go back to re reminding you that diversity is important here, you know, and, and also carrying a little risk is okay too. And I, another thing that CIFCO has done that I really like are, is the landscape level fire, the fire behavior plan. That's, that's a, a good way to start thinking about where you need to be a little more hygienic and can be a little bit less hygienic. Uh, that's part of that diversity. Uh, this is the Hera Proctor Community Forest, uh, and you'll notice there's a lot more on the ground uh, there, which I like. And uh, unlike uh, CIFCO, who has, doesn't have the, 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 quite the, the structure to do that yet, these Hera Proctor, uh, the trees you see there are full cycle trees. When I do forest management, I want continuous forest cover. And so those big trees that are the main ones I want to leave stay there forever. Uh, they grow old, become a snag, home for cavity nesting birds that eat insects, that eat trees. Big thing coming with climate change. Uh, it's already here. Uh, and then they fall down and create that decayed wood nourish the, the soil biota. So, uh, thanks for bearing with all this. <laughs> I think the way we get there is to think like a forest ecosystem in a climate change world, and we can have a happy ending. Thank you. Okay, well, the seedling one first. Um, I, I really like natural regeneration. I, I, I mean, we planting we, it should be an act of restoration, not, not an act of logging. Uh, I, when, when you, if you design logging and forestry right, you get natural regeneration of trees. They pick out, the, it's well understood now that they pick out the best sites from, in terms of soil. So you can have two of them growing from me to that tree that are big trees and then one, uh, not, not another one until you get to Kai back there. And that's fine because that's part of 
uh, that's part of a selection process. So I want natural regeneration. Um, I, I think there's a step when after you thin, uh, take out the fire ladders, uh, remove some of the overstory, because one of the things I didn't mention is you, need, you like to have some space between the crowns of the big trees, so that makes it hard for a fire to run in, in a forest as, as, as well. And so once you get through that phase, the ladders are gone, kind of opened up the crowns, you'll get lots of, of regeneration. You'll, you'll be, depending on what happens with climate change uh, and things like that, you'll, you may very well be back in there uh, removing fire ladders again, you know. So that, uh, that, that's, uh, I, I think. And remember, natural regeneration doesn't happen as soon as you open the canopy. But it's going to happen, it, there's two things, two reasons for that. One, uh, most, most trees, conifers, are periodic seed producers. I've noticed that to be changing with climate change, and I think it has to do with distress crops. I, I think that trees are smart. As a matter of fact, if you want to read a really interesting book, read Brilliant Green, and it will explain to you that trees have 17 senses instead of our five. Uh, and uh, pretty interesting, uh, written by an ecologist, an Italian ecologist. And so, um, I'm just referring to what you said about removing the understory. Okay. And I see Cisco doing that entirely. Right. And so my question is, surely there's some balance there. So yeah, I think if you, I think you can leave some understory that that uh, that is not a fire ladder, and it's not going to burn with enough heat that it can heat up the crowns. Because it's not just lifting the fire, but you get branches and small trees that, when they burn, get hot enough that they can actually ignite the crowns, even though they're not touching them or close to them. Uh, for me, it's again that the answer to your question is locked up in that diversity. Uh, do, you know, open it up, fine. But where you can, where you have openings and things like that, leave some. You know, that's, that's going to. But the next thing, see, one of the really hard things, and it's a fair comment about the answer that I just gave you, is, well, what about moisture stress? Because the more vegetation you have there, the more trees you have there, the more you're taking surface soil moisture from those little trees, or with those little trees, that have more root systems close to the surface that won't get to those bigger trees that you want to sustain a forest on that site. Uh, and that's where I find kind of an interesting uh, compromise uh, instead of piling and burning to be chipping in places because chips aren't long-term carbon storage. They, anybody who uses bark mulch in your, in your gardens knows uh, in three or four years or five years, it's pretty well part of the humus. Uh, and so, uh, but chipping is also expensive. I, I understand that operationally. Uh, it's easy to, uh, chippers are expensive, especially ones that can move around in there. And if you break teeth in them, it gets more expensive. So, so there's some operational challenges that, that I know from talking with people in CIFCO that they're, they're thinking about. Um, I still, I mean, it's just, it's me, uh, not a right or wrong answer, but I still like diversity. I still like trying uh, different, different things there. How about what Julia mentioned about, as opposed to scattering on the limbs, making small mm. piles of the area? Yeah, I, I mean, that's okay. I'm not sure what you achieve by that. Uh, yeah. Pardon me? Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, and, and it's regrettably used by timber companies to justify uh, that in clear cutting. Uh, but I see to me, to me, uh, uh, what, uh, that's, that's okay. You know, I mean, I'm, I think if that has a specific design and purpose that way, uh, that, that would work for me. I, I would like to see for songbird habitat uh, some patches where you 
where the crowns, the bigger trees, were thinned more widely and you left some intermediate and suppressed trees, uh, that some of which are going to become small snags and habitat for chickadees and small cav cavity nesting birds, things like that. Does that also contribute to water retention? Yeah. Yeah, it will. It will definitely do that. For, and and that's, that's an argument as opposed to leaving living little trees, an argument for leaving where you can limbs and lopped parts of trees and things on the ground is that that will hold moisture as opposed to take, taking moisture away. And, and so, and they have, they're short lived too. I, I, that ecocultural restoration, if I showed you some of the work that we do there, uh, the, we do a lot of thinning uh, of these overstocked dry Douglas fir forests. And we're not interested and haven't to this point sold any logs. We use, we want to rebuild the fallen trees on the forest floor, but we have to do a dance around keeping the Doug Douglas fir bark beetle and a few things at bay, which we have a few tricks for. Uh, and uh, and there, there we lop and scatter the tops. And it's interesting to me how it's this, we're talking about a place that gets historically less than 10 inches of precipitation a year. And they, there in three to four years, if they're lopped and scattered and you know down about that far from the forest floor, which is work, but uh, doable for sure, within three or four years, it's pretty well gone. You know, while it's flat, you can still see the limbs and, and things like that. And it does, that's part of our moisture retention uh, goal there to do that. Natural forest fire actually produces a lot of charcoal, and I would it be good to turn some of the branches into charcoal because charcoal purifies water, it sequesters carbon, and it also builds soil. Yeah, if you can get the right kind of heat uh, to produce biochar or something like like that, uh, that's that's a, a good thing. I it's. Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, these are good questions because they're all questions to me that keep going back to that word diversity for me, that, that, that you want, that, that it's, it's easy uh, to kind of get carried away. And I, I know from, like, I've trained this crew at Heclip, and these guys are really good at what they do. And, but I also know <laughs> just from the fact that I'm not there that much these days and, and when I go over there, it's somehow or another our species has a tendency to slide into homogeneity, <laughs> to, to sl slide into kind of continuing to do something that works like that. And I think it's a, 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 a really important job uh, that which you have a chance for those of you who live around where CIFCO and others work with in your, your part of the community, their part of the community, to help them out with that, to, to you know, to try some uh, th that, to encourage that. Uh, I, I, I don't know why there's that tendency, but boy, I've seen that over and over again, that, to, that happen with, <laughs> with restoration crews and forest crews and things like that. It's, uh, part, of it, part of it is taking the time to give the crew some decision-making power around things too. And I, I personally think that, that that's a really good thing to do because then you build people that are thinking on their feet and, 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 and you want them to, to be doing that when they're doing it. So. Well, it helps if somebody who who's sort of was uh, working a lot with making uh, biochar and I think that was Oregon and I communicated a little bit with her and she said that uh, branches that have been, you know, decayed even for uh, for a year like that won't make charcoal anymore that actually the carbon is, is out of them. They, they'll still be intact looking branches, mm -hmm. but as soon as they're sort of a little funky through and through, the, the, the carbon is already gone. Well, and that's a good point, because you, 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 you are going to be left with a with a lot of cellulose and uh, and lignin that that 
the structure within, but you'll still have some carbon. I wouldn't say all the carbon is, but that's, that's, the same, that's the same thing that happens fairly readily with chips too, you know, that's that. Uh, but the, that, that's also, the other thing that's out of there is nitrogen and a lot of other things that are part of, of maintaining the nutrient status of soils too. I think to keep one thing uh, kind of in front of us is that when it comes to losing carbon and things there, that's not a major issue. You know, that's, that's not, uh, that, that's totally different than taking something this big out of the forest and turning it uh, into, into carbon in five or six years. So it's... Uh, but the problem when you turn, when you burn it, you turn it all into ash. That ash probably doesn't stay on the site all that well, you know, in the water. No. No, I, I would, I, I, I understand why, and, and I've done a little bit of that in my own um, backyard of, of burning some piles and things, and I, I have to say I'm not a huge fan of the results of, of either where the burning takes place or where uh, they, that it's, too, it's easy to get too hygienic uh, in, in that, so. And, you one question? Yeah. Because we've got to be out of here technically okay. in 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. We could keep you talking all night, but maybe just... Okay. This is the first part of your talk. I could almost feel that we really shouldn't be doing any logging in the Spokane Valley at all. But as I got towards the end, I realized that that's not what you said at all. Uh, the example, I suppose, is Shawnigan Lake, where you have that. Uh, it's very carefully planned uh, forest with areas that are reserved and even where logging is, is, is allowed, it's allowed only very carefully and some trees are, are being left. So it's a model of a very closely managed forest, intimately managed, and I just can't see that being done at the scale of modern industrial forestry. So one of the, one of the corollaries of this would seem to me that and come, in a sense, it comes back to the native side of this, is very local, community-managed forests where people are intimately involved with the forest, know them well, and can work out that scale of, of, of planning. Is, 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 that, is that all entailed in what, you're, in what you're talking about? Yeah, I've spent a lot of my life trying to get local control of forests. <laughs> uh, there was uh, a handful of us in the... 80s and 90s that I think had a fair responsibility in getting that NDP government into setting up community forest agreements, uh, which are is a way, not perfect, but it's a way of getting that control back to communities. The 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 sort of uh, the, the sort of wolf in the closet, or not good, uh, the sort of bad guy. We won't call him a wolf in the closet is the tenure system and the, what, what if, if we changed one thing in BC that could have a huge impact is the fact that we now have with professional reliance getting rid of the Forest Service and the tenure system which gave uh, uh, the land uh, to multinational, well at that time they were, yeah, they were multinational then too the t timber companies starting in the late 40s and early 50s, uh, they, public land was given to large companies in exchange for them building mills uh, and, and providing employment in rural towns. I think it was still a pretty industry-driven approach to that, but I can see in the 40s and 50s a little bit more social rationalization for for that, that occurring than I can now. A really key part of that, those tenures, those long-term leases, uh, it, it was that it was public land and if companies wanted to sell them or exchange them, they had to get government approval. Uh, and that the, the government, that governments for years said they don't have any value. You can't, you can only sell the infrastructure that you put there, uh, you can't sell public land because 
we gave it to you. Now don't tell me you can turn around and make millions exchanging it with another company. Well, slowly through the years, that's what's happened. Uh, and so not only are these big tenure uh, holders cutting trees in ways that aren't good for climate change and a lot of other purposes, uh, but they, they have uh, the ability to make money amongst each other by selling our public land that we gave to them. It was a big mistake to set up the tenure system, and we need to take that back. We need, and, and a good way, I mean, it's been done in other jurisdictions in the world. Uh, I mean, my goodness, if somebody whines about their investment, you can go, well, wait a minute. Uh, you've had this for, what, 30 years? Uh, I think you've more than amortized it many times. And let's look at the profits that have gone out of here over that period of time. Uh, and so you say to them, you give them a transition period, a three-year transition period to wind down and move back to a forest service uh, that's accountable to the public, that plans and manages the land with plans like I showed you there. And then you say to the timber companies, if you want to, to log, if you want logs for a mill or logs to sell to someone, you bid on these logs. So, and we'll take the highest bidder. Uh, and that's controlled by a socially responsible agency like the Forest Service with plans like I showed you. Uh, there's been, I was involved in, in a process like that. Jim Smith and Tom Milne, who are, Jim is a retired forester, Tom's a retired Forest Service employee, who in Vernon, <coughs> uh, they asked me, this was in the early 90s, we, uh, the, Jim was a small business forester, and he wanted to manage the small business program using an ecosystem-based plan. So we designed site level. We didn't do a lot of landscape level, but we did designed a bunch of site level plans like I just showed you tonight. Uh, they then took that wood to a, lo a log sort yard that was run by the Forest Service. They didn't weigh scale it because weigh scaling is a conversion. It's a conversion of weight to volume. And it, it has been used to manipulate uh, the, the, the amount of volume that goes through a weigh scale for decades, uh, and that was proven by this, the log sort yard because they were all hand scaled. They first of all got 10 to 15 percent more volume uh, than, uh, than the average that came from weigh scaling, and by, by, auctioning the, by, the, uh, by auctioning the wood through the log sort yard, they got uh, returns from three to eight or nine times the amount per cubic meter than the province was charging the companies through the tenure system. So uh, we're losing in many ways. We're losing in terms of public revenue. We're losing in terms of knowing just exactly how much uh, gets cut and taken out of forests. Uh, and if, if we made, if, if we took, and to me, climate change is the built-in reason to do it. Saying, sorry guys, what you're doing isn't cutting it. And these are public lands. Uh, you've more than benefited from them for, for decades. Now we're gonna invest them in socially responsible bodies and we'll tell you the conditions under which you can, can purchase wood. Some companies will disappear. I have no doubt about that, but uh, the ones that really are efficiency oriented uh, and uh, aren't just looking for um, sort of corporate welfare bums, uh, they, they're gonna be people that survive. And you know, little operations like Hera Proctor could survive in, in that kind of situation. So that's the kind of model that, uh, that, that we need to put in place. And it's doable, it's just we have Th have reason after reason telling us that not only is it doable, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's absolutely imperative right now. So, but I agree with your point uh, that we need, that's, that's how to get it back into public hands. Thank you so much. Okay.